oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, so if a Catholic was writing about, you know, Augustine or, you know, and, and his spirituality and his interactions with God, a proper critique to that article wouldn't be, well, but God doesn't exist, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I got a hoax article into Catholic Journal. I said God doesn't exist, and it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Worked out. Honestly, if someone could pull that off, I would be so very impressed. You might be able to do it with an Episcopalian journal. <laughs> Damn. I, I, that might be the end credits right there. I, I, <laughs> that, that might be the opener right there. That, that's oh, yeah. Oh, no, right yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, so... Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of The Problem with Reading. Uh, I'm Brevin. I'm Steven. And I'm Sam. And uh, here we are, live from quarantine. It's it's day five. Uh, so far, I've... I've it's eaten, only day five? I, it's only day know, five for you? Things. You freaking noob. <laughs> it's, it's very much not day five. It's what, like day 17, something like that? Mm-hmm. I've lost track. You know, the time, time is meaningless in the, in the quarantine. That's yeah, that's true. How are how are y'all holding up? Oh, you know, the piles of corpses outside are starting to wear away at the morale, but uh I do talk with the uh the friendly plague doctor every so often. That kind of gives me some human contact. You have human contact? My god, I always have a volleyball that I've been talking to. <laughs> Wilson! <laughs> how about Oddly you, enough, the plague doctor's I name mean, is I, Wilson. I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. I mean, we're we're sitting here um going nowhere. My my hair is starting to look back like high school. So that's fun. Um, waiting for for all services to reopen. Um, we're working online uh, my days away, so that's that's going all right. And um, yeah, I mean, nothing too too eventful. Nothing at all, actually. All right. Uh, well, yeah. on that note, uh, what are y'all drinking? Uh, I am drinking the last uh, of my pot of coffee. My room, my old roommate was kind enough to uh, give me the French press, and so I have been using it excessively, and it is a glorious thing. Very nice. Uh, as for myself, I'm having some knockoff LaCroix uh, sparkling water with just a, the tiniest hint of flavor. Uh, and the flavor is dragon fruit berry. Um, I don't really know what that means, but that's what I'm having. Hmm. Well, with LaCroix, you sure know that what you're tasting is not going to give you an accurate representation of dragon fruit berry. So unfortunately, you, you're still not going to have much of a knowledge of that. No, oh, yeah. It's like a dream of the memory of what someone described the flavor as. Mm. Mm-hmm. the drink equivalent of inception more or less how about you sam um i'm i'm drinking uh coffee far less or far worse coffee than steven it's uh it's a keurig made green mountain nantucket blend so um yeah with a little bit of cream it's all right appreciate your faith in me but mine's folgers so i think we're at <laughs> roughly the same level okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's good there's folgers folgers in the in french fancy press? french press i don't you know man i i keep it classy <laughs> there's there's definitely some sort of poetry or like deep contradiction there that should be fully explicated in like a mournful poem. Um, mm. But uh, speaking of poetry in motion, uh, we have one article this week, uh, specially picked out by uh, good old Sam here. Uh, Sam, why don't you give us a rundown of uh, what's going off? What's going on in academia these days? Um, what's going on in academia is not not good. Um, this is. An article. It's one of the most entertaining articles I've ever read, um, and I'm still split on what the on what the conclusion exactly is. And I don't think I necessarily agree with the authors on their conclusion, but I still think the article is worth reading. And if nothing else, I think the humorous value makes it excellent. So this article is published in the online journal Arrow. And it's entitled Academic Grievance Studies and the Corruption of Scholarship. And this is an article by three authors who are describing a year or a ten month long project that they conducted to investigate um, the quality of the peer review process and the quality of papers being published in certain journals um, of areas that they have studied before. Um, These areas include cultural studies, identity studies, um, and critical theory, which at the end of this whole process, they termed as grievance studies. These are studies that focus primarily on the grievances of the subject. Um, Basically, their overall theory is that these these studies are inherently destructive towards the tenets of our modern civilization, including liberalism, progress, modernity, open inquiry, and social justice. That last one seems quite contradictory, but they kind of, they explain that as they go through 
the different th their their whole project. Their entire methodology was what they call a, ref a reflective ethnography. They hope to become outsiders um, within this culture and to become fully immersed in the culture of this um, these academic disciplines. In order to do that, they learn the culture thoroughly through reading a whole host of articles and then attempted to write their own papers in this field. Now, while they had while these were all academics, uh, professional academics, none of them were particularly practiced in these disciplines. They'd only interacted with them tangentially. But they but through reading papers in these fields, they seek to write basically hoax papers, papers that were not intended to prove any facts, were using false data, or, and actually all of them, were humorous in some way. They were overtly humorous and ridiculous. What they were, seeing, what they were trying to do was seeing that if they submitted papers that were fundamentally broken in some way, that they couldn't be falsified in any way, that they were um, hastily constructed and just citing legitimate papers in the field um, or citing legitimate papers in their field widely, but not actually contributing anything to the field, they were asserting these papers could get published. Each paper was also trying to test a certain hypothesis. So in the, formulating their false thesis, they were trying to see if they could get a certain idea published into that field. What they, The way they did this was they started with an ethical or epistemological concern with that field, such as the field publishing articles that align politically without any substantiation or being okay with using certain buzzwords um, in a very destructive argument. And then from that, from that core concern, they built an outlandish argument around it, supported it with existing literature, and submitted it. This is sophistry over knowledge. Which they're creating an argument for the sake of making that argument, with not for the sake of actually discovering something new. Now, the as they started this project, these papers were actually very well received. Um, a quote from the article is that, quote, we started to realize that just about anything he made to work, so long as it falls within the moral orthodoxy and demonstrates an understanding of existing literature. So the results of the study um, are quite striking. They wrote 20 papers over the course of 10 months, which is an insane academic output. That means that they were putting out one paper every two weeks or so. They the results were seven of these papers were accepted into leading journals in the field. Four, four were published and three were accepted and waiting to be published, which can take several months. Seven other papers were still in progress. Two were given were were um, rejected and asked to re be revised and resubmitted, which they did, and they were in the resubmission process. One was still under its first review, and four were rejected, but were awaiting resubmission and were looking promising. Um, six of these papers, they retired as fatally flawed. They submitted them, they were rejected, and they said, okay, that paper was you know not worth publishing, we're done. Out of the papers that were accepted, they also saw a few other results. They got four invitations to peer review other papers, signaling that not only were their papers being accepted, but actually the fake authors that they were publishing these papers under were becoming accepted professionals in the field um, off their work. And one paper was given special recognition in, in the Journal of Gender, Place, and Culture. All this happened, again, in 10 months. Now, this whole project ended prematurely when one, their paper that that won them an award, which they um they called or they, they they the paper that won them an award, which they called Dog Parks, came under suspicion after this award. The Wall Street Journal picked it up and they came clean about the fact that this was all a hoax. Now they after this whole project, they wrote this article in a, in um in Arrow, and in this article they identify the central problem in these fields as being critical constructivism, basically the belief that common features and experiences can be socially constructed. These constructions are, are believed to be dependent on power dynamics between people, and science and reason are, dismi are dismissed in order to allow for new ways of knowing. The authors point out this is opposed to universal liberalism and scientific knowledge, which is what academia is based on. Um, they claim that peer reviewing is no check against this critical constructivist um, approach, and it's actually furthering it. Now, they're, in their discussion after the at the, at the end of their article, they say that we should doubt, they basically conclude that we should doubt the rigor in these fields. Um, they shouldn't overstate their conclusion. They point out that not everyone in these fields is biased, and most people are have um, have legitimate aims. Most people are con concerned and actually genuinely giving helpful feedback. But overall, the fact that seven papers could be published in this field by people who are not experts, and these papers could be so obviously fatally flawed, indicates that this is not this is not a unique situation. And they point to the papers that they are citing as examples of where um, the quality of work has been 
has been low in the past. This is rapidly harming the legitimacy and reputation of universities and is causing for a, right, for a strong right-wing reaction to these fields. And so the authors in the end are calling for, for these fields to reconsider their standards, to play, put in place higher standards, um, to question social constructionist arguments, and ultimately to continue to further their aims of social justice for the betterment of all. Now, I think this article is really very interesting, and we can go into some of their their actual fake articles later because they are quite quite humorous. But my reaction to this is that I think they bring up a good critique. I think they're the critique that these journals are not using high academic rigor is legitimate. I think that's something they should point out. But something that I felt coming out of the article and, and something that's been pointed out by many other experts in both their so-called grievance studies and other fields is that they may not they their ability to prove their conclusion to prove that all all these fields are lacking rigor is low, and part of that is because they don't they may not be necessarily fo- necessarily following the most ethical route. So at the end of the day, I think this article is interesting. I think it I think it um, gives a valid critique of these fields, but I'm not necessarily sure what the extent is of that. Critique. Honestly, this was a a brilliant uh, article that they published and. I really respect the project that they went about. Um, I think I think the sort of project of making sure that a field that is becoming that is both new but also is becoming more and more prevalent in society and more and more respected, more and more respected at least in pockets of society, uh, but growing into a mainstream respect, but that a lot of people have legitimate concerns about. I think this sort of project is important uh, because it does question the legitimacy of a lot of the scholarship. Um, I, I watched a, a YouTube video that was um, the the three authors, uh, the three de- uh, kind of architects of this this project uh, speaking, and they said that like the scary thing about this field of scholarship is that they are being cited when th- when their ideas are going mainstream. So when you have, for example, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with microaggression training or what have you, but when you have microaggression training and people question it, they like the the response is, well, there's a whole body of scholarship out there that is supporting this micro or this this concept of microaggressions. And one of the uh, the authors of this paper was saying, like, he'd go to colleagues and say, hey, look, all this research is not falsifiable. No matter what I say, you're going to have a way around it. Like no matter if I have direct evidence saying that microaggressions aren't a thing, you have some slippery way of saying, well, but actually they are because X, Y, and Z. That's not science. That is that is not a not that science is the only way of gathering knowledge, but this is in this particular case, you're trying to make scientific claims that just are not falsifiable. And at least according to Popper, that's not science. You do get this scary phenomenon where all of the all of this body of research, all this uh, this kind of collection of quote unquote knowledge, is being used to justify a lot of new policies that are becoming more and more powerful. I've had microaggression training myself at um, at Microsoft, and a lot of the stuff is really good stuff. Um, and I'm not going to complain about encouraging to treat you know women better, uh, encouraging to treat uh, minorities with respect. All these are good things. But when it does get to a point where communication is starting to be viewed as violence and whatnot, and this sort of this sort of paradigm is always being supported on this body of scholarship that may be faulty, that's that is concerning. Maybe the most dangerous part of the whole affair is the sort of poisonous marriage in between the most generous presumption of truth seeking and at least attempted objectivity and such on the part of scholars and scientists and just that there is a category of academics which cover all sorts of fields everything from you know social sciences like economics to you know biology to these more specific sort of cultural studies uh, split off fields and there's a sort of a, a universal language that you talk about it that you know elevates anything that people in these categories say that gives it a certain level of respect that gives it a certain level of validity because there's a, a presumption of rigor and knowledge and uh, some kind of disinterest or at least disinterest to the point in which it your interests would not preclude you from from following through 
whatever you're studying to the to the to the conclusions you find and not to only ones that you want to find. The thing that makes it so hard for me to parse incidents like this, and there have been other ones in the past, and you know, they're always fun examples of them on online, but is so while at the same time I want to, you know, I I, I have the you know sort of small c conservative resistance to like scientism and overstating what we can prove with math more or less and and in fact the book that we're just starting to read right now the master and his emissary is i believe sort of starting to go in that direction um that there can be a you know over reliance on a way of thinking that extracts things from their particularities and attempts to dissect them and turn them into objects for study that is harmful and 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 makes it our that impoverishes our way of viewing and understanding the world. So as much as I want to be suspicious of that whole, you know, scientism, scientist, scientific project, which are not the same thing, things like this make me want to just like throw up my hands and scream because just the the total demonstrated lack of rigor, the things that count as scholarship and, you know, worth the time to research or, or, or that people consider worth, you know, vast resources to be put into it is just, it's so hard to wrap my head around. And part of that is just, you know, like I care about the specific things that I care about and I would love to see them researched, you know, ad infinitum and other people have special interests that they would love to see researched ad infinitum. And then, you know, we're never going to cross that line, but the parasitic nature of these fields on the credibility of academia as like a productive field in terms of research is something I think that I can, even with my, you know, sort of suspicion of science in as a, as, as a sufficient field for all aspects of life that I, I can still, anyway, I can be on the same side as the more rigorous fields um, in this instance. You, you brought up parasitism and I'm glad you did because not only is it parasitic on uh, kind of the respectable field of academia, but it's also parasitic on a lot of the fields that it proclaims to kind of be forwarding, uh, such as kind of the civil rights movement, uh, and more recently, the uh, sexual equality movement. Um, it, it, they they claim that like they are, they are fighting for this, but the three authors, all of whom are very liberal atheists, are saying, no, they're, they're taking these very good social movements, and they're corrupting them, and they're making them out to be this like really dominant, um, almost predatory uh practice where you use the the word racist um and instead of trying to eliminate racist you it, you you spread it out to make it so that everyone is inherently racist and you use it almost as a power play um which is indeed a pretty pretty shady way to use um these these movements that you claim to be uh kind of advancing all three authors were uh, I, kind of in the in the clip that I I viewed, they all showed some pretty serious moral disgust with the fact that they were kind of playing off of these movements uh, and seemed to be taking advantage of them. Yeah, I mean, one of the best examples of that um, in their research was their um, their paper, "Our Struggle Is My Struggle: Solidarity Feminism in an in an intersectional reply to neoliberal and choice feminism, which the article's thesis is basically that there's only one sort of uh, permissible feminism that is allowed, and that all females and all feminist-minded people must unify behind this one choice, this one, th th this one view. Now, this article got accepted. The problem with this article is it was actually an excerpt of um of Mein Kampf. Chapter Twelve, Volume One, where they had replaced any um, any objection any any objectionable language with buzzwords like feminism, like women, um, stuff like that, which really is and this is awful on multiple levels. First of all, it's quite concerning that you could get um, the words of of Adolf Hitler published in a um, a modern journal as legitimate scholarship. Um, but secondly. The argument itself is that there's only one acceptable vision, and everyone must unite behind that one vision for the good of of all. Which I mean, I think that they're asserting is a is a is a is a fascist argument. I'm not going to hesitate to use that word, considering it's it's lost all meaning um, today. But that's the core of of the argument that was true in the 30s, and they're asserting it's being used now. Which, incidentally, for a body of scholars in sociology, I would expect all of them to be at least moderately familiar with Mein Kampf, given that 
it, though morally reprehensible, of course, is a sociological phenomenon that, I don't know, I would think any historian or any sociologist would probably have at least read at one point in time in their in their background. So I am also just a little surprised that they were able to slide that right through. But so we obviously each have our own responses to this whole event, but several other publications solicited the responses of academics in these fields and from outside. And in fact, at least one academic who actually reviewed one of the phony articles that was created over the course of this project. Uh, Stephen, I think you have that. Yes. Um, so uh, the Chronicle uh, or the Chronicle of Higher Education had, did a really good job uh, kind of trying to gather a across the spectrum uh, list of responses to uh, this grievance studies hoax. Um, and it's it's interesting because the word hoax was used both in the positive and negative across, uh, across the board. There were probably an even distribution of people who were saying this is an excellent uh, project and people who were saying this is a morally onerous uh, project. Uh, I... I would encourage everyone. It's a really short collection of uh, articles, and each article is only like five or six paragraphs long. I'm going to go just because all three of us lean at least more moderate conservative. I'm going to uh, present two articles that are in defense or in defense of gender studies, sociology, etc., slash in attack of this hoax, just to try to pre- present some amount of objectivity and the uh the two i'm going to present one i think is an excellent response one i think is a terrible response uh the first a strange start to peer reviewing by david sheber uh or sheber apologies if i got that wrong uh mr sheber dr sheber um this this person he was one of the reviewers of a uh, a paper the one of the the hoax papers uh which tried to in in essence uh academize uh thought crimes uh, in saying that uh, fantasizing about uh, someone while masturbating is, in essence, doing violence against them, which, on a side note, I actually don't entirely disagree with that, given Christ's, uh, you know, exhortion that if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. I actually think that there is something very edifying about that, but that's besides the point. Um, uh, this guy, he he said that he had experienced in his time of scholarship uh, plenty of paper rejections from the notorious reviewer number two, which, if you don't know, is a trope in the academic world where reviewer number two is always the most harsh one, the always the one that just kind of says like, nope, this is unsolvable. This is a horrible paper. Throw it away. And so when he received this paper, he immediately thought, this is a bad paper. This There's no way I'm going to sign off on this. I'm going to reject this. But instead of instead of just kind of rejecting it out of hand with no constructive criticism, he tried to point point out the good parts of it, point out things that maybe the author could improve on, uh, and in essence, try to get it heading in the right direction, maybe salvage some bits of it so it could be transformed into a, a proper paper. And it, they they took a lot of his comments, at least somewhat out of context, and made it sound like he super approved of the idea. Um and that it got rejected for other reasons. And he, I, it, it, this was his first time reviewing a paper, and he actually concludes, quote, my first reviewing experience has been strange, and if nothing else, I'm moving on confident in my decision to be a critical yet constructive scholar, end quote. Uh, he says, quote, I am still glad I chose not to be reviewer number two, end quote. So I think he provides an excellent example of what scholarship is supposed to be, that he did... He did his intellectual duty. He tried to provide a way that this paper could uh, could um, add to the body of scholarship that he viewed probably correctly as legitimate, uh, but he still rejected it. And so I think this was a good example of how this hoax didn't necessarily prove what the authors intended. And it also shows that the authors were indeed submitting these papers in bad faith. And maybe we should take some of their thoughts uh, with a, a grain of salt. Following this is the really poor response, in my opinion, uh, the title, Only a Rube Would Believe Gender Studies, Gender Studies Has Produced Nothing of Value uh, by uh, Drs. Lori Essig and Sujata Morty. Uh, and unfortunately, the title is pretty much the entire article, pretty much them doing a whole lot of ad hominems, poisoning the wells, saying that you know, only gullible people would would believe this. Uh, turns out that the media is is mightily gullible, quote unquote. That they would you know believe such a silly hoax uh, that 
uh, quote, this bandwagon ce celebration of the hoax comes, of course, from people outside and largely unfamiliar with gender studies. But whether it's the philosophical depth of uh, Angela Davis or the beauty of a Kimberly Crenshaw's theories, only a Rue would believe that the field has produced something of value, end quote. And pretty much them consistently just kind of pounding away at the drum of, no, this is a good, this is a good field. This is a good field. Which the annoying thing is, the, the hoaxers are not saying this is a bad field. They're saying that this field has become corrupt because it were due to sophistry and they're trying to root out the sophistry but leave in the philosophy uh so i thought this was a very poor response uh because it pretty much took everything that the hoaxers were trying to say like this is bad and just doubled down on it and said like no this is how it works so i anyone who disagrees with us is just wrong because they're wrong so i think i would highly recommend reading all of uh, all of the responses i think some of the responses are excellent apologias some of them are excellent uh attacks um so would recommend. I read all those responses and they do have me thinking. Those ones and there was a New York Times article that was that was linked in one of the responses uh, that I also read where they the New York Times right after this this um story broke also wrote an article alongside the Wall Street Journal. And there was one quote there from Jacob Levy, who's a scholar on the left who I have actually I really appreciate. And he his comment was that anyone could do this in any field if they devoted a full year to it. You could create a convincing article if you devoted all your time to it and were trying to hoax someone. But that doesn't necessarily prove complete corruption. And I think I think I agree with that for the most part. I would argue that in the field of math, for example, if you have clear logical flaws, any reviewer worth their salt is just going to immediately root out and just, and just say like, well, you're wrong. Like, sorry, two plus two doesn't equal five. You're wrong. That's that's what reviewers are there for. But then again, I also have to admit, the more concrete you get, or the sorry, the more abstract you get, the more difficult it becomes to do that. It's certainly, that may be quote unquote easy to do in math and maybe physics and maybe chemistry and maybe biology. But like the more the more I don't want to say abstract. Abstract's not the right word. Um, but maybe the more applied the field gets, or the more subject to interpretation mm -hmm. the field gets. Certainly, the more easy it is to, to screw things up. Look at philosophy, for example, and look at the, the body of scholarship, all of which, like, the only consistent thing is that no one can agree with each other. And so mm -hmm. I have to say, even in my beloved field of philosophy, sure, if you give, you know, three pretty smart people, all the, the, and these three hoaxers are all very intelligent, give them three years to get up to speed on philosophy. I think one of them is actually a professor in philosophy, so maybe not the best example, but let's say they were all complete noobs at philosophy. Give them a year to, to research a bunch of philosophy and then submit a bunch of papers. They could probably get in and then say, ha, sure showed them, but at the same time. Yeah, and one of them is actually, so one of them is philosophy and another one is a math professor actually. And oh, that's right. So I guess one possible extra critique of this article is that well he's trying to apply standards that you see in mathematics and standards of objectivity and truth mm -hmm. to fields of social science where to to very new fields of social science where we haven't necessarily figured out what the standards of truth are yet and i think that's an excellent repair um to their project uh kind of a good defense uh, on that critique um that there just needs to be stronger stronger ways of falsifying slash verifying there just needs to be better gatekeepers um or stronger gates maybe maybe the gatekeepers aren't at what's fault maybe it's just the gates uh that are but so yeah so i i the the nuance is certainly appreciated i do think there are a couple things that you're that the critiques of the authors is overlooking, which is the authors argue and arguably demonstrate at least in in part, especially by their success in getting things accepted, that there that there's a relatively unified ideological bent to the field that they're identifying. Whereas philosophy doesn't have is is too broad to have a large ideological bent. Math also does not have a large ideological bent. And that's if that's at the core, like what's the point of of hoaxing a math journal? There's there's no there's no winning in that. There's no. There's nothing to be gained. But within this field, or at, you know, at, at least arguably, the issue is is that it's motivated scholarship. Is that there is a clear project of many of the participants that is undisclosed from people who are consuming the downstream effects of it. 
Right. And I think it, I, in the video uh, that I've referenced a couple times now, they, they've brought that up in that a lot of people are relying on this, on this scholarship um, and kind of counting on it, resting on some objectivity. But the problem is this, this corpus of knowledge is actually all self-referential. And they said that they several times would kind of like go down these rabbit holes of they would read a paper, they would read all that paper citations, all those paper citations, all those paper citations, and eventually would just kind of like end up in this loop of just papers that rep reference papers, but that reference the original papers and that there is no seemingly objectivity that goes on with that. And that's where they get really nervous. And that's where they start contending that this is sophistry, not knowledge gaining. Yeah. The other um, aspect to this is I don't know if I, so, so like it, part of that, what I just mentioned goes to the, to, to the motivation and, and what you're pointing out does the same thing. The other aspect of it, though, is the the New York Times article saying that if you spent a year, you could hoax any field. And, you you know, in some cases, you said that that's not true. But part of the issue is that, so if the excuse is some fields are more subjective, and if you spent a sufficient am amount of time, there aren't enough, uh, there isn't enough of a methodology that you could prevent a hoax. Well, I, I mean, in terms of scholarship, at least, that's an indictment against the field as a whole. That's not a defense of it. That's just saying that this field is incapable of, you know, self-regulating, which should demote almost completely the idea that it's any kind of elevated knowledge. Is that wrong yeah. somehow? Uh, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, and also kind of like you said, like you, if you spend a year dedicated to, you know, trying to hoax a math journal, it's like, good luck. There's no way you can. I mean, the, the, um, I've talked to, you know, some math professors who said that like they, they would need to do like nine years of postdoctoral to even start doing any serious scholarship in their field. Um, it, like in physics, I'm going to go out on a limb and say is probably roughly the same. So like there are just some fields where it's like, no, you, you can't, you need to become an expert and then you need to start producing results that are verified by experts. Like this, this just doesn't like, that's just not fair. Um, it is it is interesting to note that like these these individuals did need to read a whole body of literature to become well versed in it and then write the papers. So in a way they did have to become experts to receive any positive response but then the ironic thing is they became experts and then started putting forward stuff that they knew was absolute nonsense and then were still getting accepted. So honestly I I do think that it is a pretty big indictment on the field if you if you're able to publish what you know is nonsense and that's accepted it's like well <laughs> It's not much of a defense to say like, well, like that could happen in any field because of the fact, the fact matter is no, it can't happen in any field. And if it can't happen in other fields, well, maybe those fields need to be start being seriously questioned. Yeah. At that point, all, all that you've defended is, or, or, or all that you've, you know, if, if, if you use the defense and if you take a sufficient amount of time, all that that means is that the fields in, in which that is successful are fields in which, as I think the authors say more or less correctly, that there that it's not about knowledge creation it's about learning a particular dialect or a particular language that you know your fellows in the field can identify and say ah you are one of us we're on the same team as opposed to something to be tested and uh you know to expand humanity's field of knowledge yeah like i even look to my to my own field of economics where you know you could theoretically a hoax in economics paper, but you would have to do so much research and understand the math behind it and understand where the field is that it would be difficult. I mean, it would be difficult to to completely falsify information, partially because a lot of the data that is used is so well reported that you couldn't just, as in the example of their dog parks um, paper, throw together a large amount of, of fake data, say that you interviewed 10,000 dog owners and you know go with that. Um, so I think there are certain fields that are less susceptible to this than others. And I, I think the scary thing about, you know, you bring up the dog, uh, the dog ones, and it's the fact that they had this large set of data, which you could maybe say like, okay, just straight up falsifying data is kind of shady. But the fact of the matter is they weren't even questioned on that. Like that wasn't the problem anyone had with like, hey, are these numbers like these numbers just don't seem right. This, this, these aren't verifying what we'd expect them to verify slash it's verifying it too well slash we can run, you know, certain algorithms to test whether or not this is this makes sense. It was, hey, did you respect the dog's privacy when you were inspecting their genitals? Like it just, <laughs> it, it, like it, it just seems that the, the concerns that these scholars would have were just completely 
not, I mean, I guess maybe you could make the argument that, yeah, like getting all up in a dog's business is a little weird, but like, that's the concern really. Or uh, I think one, another example would be um, in the, uh, their paper fat bodybuilding, uh, the title, uh, who are they to judge overcoming anthropometry and a framework for fat bodybuilding in which case, or uh, sorry, uh, the paper in which they uh, made the argument that uh, morbid obesity is actually just as valid as being quote unquote in shape. And that in fact, they should, uh, they should normalize this by um, having quote unquote bodybuilding competitions in which it's fat bodies or uh, morbidly obese bodies and the one of the biggest concerns people gave were quote from reviewer three the use of the term final frontier is problematic in at least two ways first the term frontier implies colonial expansion and hostile takeover and the genocidal erasure of indigenous peoples find another term end quote it just that's just so absurd the fact that they are actively encouraging a lifestyle of morbid obesity which is definitively connected to death to like shortened lifespan and like but that was their concern was final frontier uh the the term is final frontier and just kind of a lot of these these sort of absurdities uh seem to pop up in uh in these papers and their responses all right well um all all good so i i I think we can all agree as a group that all scholarship is fake uh the only knowledge you can trust is that which exists inside your brain already and also that each of us individually is the only person who is truly alive and all others are mere shadows of our super egos and shadow selves which are you know hidden and bubbling beneath the surface Uh, but speaking of bubbling beneath the surface sometimes you get that, that bubbles up into a rant. Uh, Steven, do you have a rant for us? Oh, man. Uh, uh, I think of anything. I mean, yeah. Oh, yes. Actually, I do have a rant. Um, and this is a, a rather trivial one. But so uh, my uh, my old bed uh, was way too small. Like I got it at Ikea. I was in kind of a hurry and didn't really test it out. And so when I, when I quote unquote tested it out, I pretty much laid on it, had my head right up against the headboard. My feet were within the parameters of the mattress, and so I figured it was okay. I then, upon purchasing it and sleeping in it several times, realized that when one sleeps, one's head is not always flush against the headboard, and realized that if I actually did stretch out all the way, my feet would always be hanging off the mattress. And I've dealt with that crap for about four and a half years and have been very frustrated with it and kind of resolved, like, I'm going to get rid of this bed whenever I can. I'm just going to have to pay the dumping fee or whatever. When I sold my house, which, huzzah, I sold my house, the new owner actually wanted to keep my bed for whatever reason. I didn't complain. I said, sure, it's all yours. But that means that I had to do the owner's job of shopping for a new mattress. And I I encountered this, and I've encountered this before when, like, purchasing a new monitor or any sort of, like, important purchase that is greater than you know 20 bucks which i can easily return or what have whatever not only are mattresses expensive but they're also really difficult to return and so the stakes are pretty high and without any exception at all whatsoever a mattress could have thousands of reviews literally thousands most of which are amazing but you always have one or two that are saying like you know zero or one stars this mattress sucks it's awful it's you know insert it's smelly it's lumpy it's half deflated or whatever. Um, And there's something so frustrating about not being able to know if that person is just trolling or if that person just had a, happened to have a really bad experience or what have you, but it's enough to introduce this shadow of doubt and make it really difficult to do any sort of online shopping, which one can only do online shopping now because of the freaking quarantine, uh, which I am 100% for by the way. So all that to say, if you are writing reviews, be honest about your reviews because for those of us that need a mattress that isn't miserable, we're counting on those. Very nice. Uh, how about you, Sam? Yeah, I've got a rant and this is um, probably a, maybe too personally motivated, but that's what a rant is for. Um, the The quarantine and the coronavirus is disrupting all areas of our life right now. And each institution has responded with varying degrees of success. One institution that has not responded well um, is that of colleges. And the lack of transparency and um, unclear motivations for decisions made by colleges today in response to the coronavirus is simply, I would say, irresponsible and warrants definitely a large amount of critique. Um, I could go into many of the um, the problems seen and maybe summarize this quickly, but, or summarize it shortly by saying that my own college canceled 
graduation, um, which is frustrating. But beyond that, it's it's the means by which they've been communicating with students and the emphasis that many have observed, which is that they focus they've focused entirely on still trying to to recruit new students when visits and other admissions events are canceled. And that's a legitimate concern. However, I'm wondering what fall the fall um, start to classes and admissions is gonna look is going to look like when Many many universities are are so overtly putting their money and effort into bringing students in versus caring for students who are currently at that university. Was that too angsty? I think nope. that's fair. Yeah, I, okay. I I I I think that works. And to to transition into my rant, uh, I I also have something that that works quite well. This is a positive rant. This might be like the the second time that I've done this, which is tabletop simulator. It's a good time. I didn't know how fun it was, but I just got it because it's like on a half off sale right now. So shout out to all the folks uh, who who want to get it half off because it's 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 half off right now. And uh, I played an excellent board game called Dead of Winter with some of uh, my uh, cousins, and the it's it's just great because like. The game board is all there. It really just feels like you're playing just on an actual game board with all of the impreciseness and having to shift tokens around and all that. And sort of probably the best thing about it, which is I'm told sort of a hangover from its its early days, but there's always a button sort of in, in the middle top of the screen that's just always there that just says flip. And I'm told that if you that if you click that button with no with no like warnings or confirmations, it just immediately flips the table and destroys the entire game that you were playing with people. Confirm. And I really want to do it sometime, maybe like when I lose or something. But anyway, tabletop simulator, excellent. It it's been uh, it's allowing me to play board games that I did not think I would be able to play that I've only been able to play with these cousins like once a year when we all gather for Christmas. And I'm very happy about that. And actually I'll be playing in a, just a couple hours here. So uh, yeah, tabletop simulator. I can confirm tabletop simulator is amazing. Uh, I use it with my friends to to play magic. I'm gonna show off my nerd card there. Oh, I just said that's a pretty that's a pretty pretty powerful nerd card you have there. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm unfamiliar with this. I didn't know anything about it. Is it on like it, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you have this mm-hmm. virtual tabletop that everyone can view and uh, it has interactable, you know, tokens and board games or card games or what have you that end up it, there's a bit of a learning curve uh, to figuring out the user interface, but it's um it's reasonably easy to use. Cool. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, for uh, everyone here at the Problem with Reading podcast, uh, I'm Brevin. I'm Steven. And I'm Stan. And we'll see you around, maybe. Just remember, BPC. Excellent. Done. Well done. This this would not have been as long as it did if we didn't spend the first like hour going over that bracket. That was fun. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent. All right. I'll send Craig away.